All right, so we are back into our, our new series called Simple. This is week three. Uh, if you haven't been here, what we're trying to do is take some messages from God's Word with some very, very well-known stories. Uh, where did we start? Anybody remember what week one was? <clears throat> David and Goliath, right? And then last week, Jesus, he did something. He walked on water, right? So Jesus and Peter walking on water. And so we're going to do another one of those today. But what we're trying to do is take this well-known Bible story that you would go, oh, I've heard everything that there is to hear from that story, and maybe look at it not so much in a deep way, but maybe more in a simple way, and to see if there's any truths in there that we haven't caught yet. Maybe we can extrapolate something else out from there. But then also as well, which I always like to do, I'm a huge fan of, to find some application in there. So you guys ready for week three? Here we go. Simple Daniel in the lion's den. This is about as cliche as it gets, right? David and Goliath, Jesus walking on water, now Daniel in the lion's den. I kind of, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to keep doing this, but I'm kind of going like Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, kind of bouncing back and forth. Like So, all right, so I want to catch you up as to what's going on in this story because the context really matters in what Daniel does in this story. So uh, Daniel was what the Bible says a young man, so probably a teenager, when he was captured in 605 BC. Now this just blows my mind that we actually know what year it was and we can look back at historical documents through, through the Bible and everything and see, oh, the Bible was just, you know, kind of, no, it, it's verified by historical documents, by other things. Never has there been an archeological find that has disproven the Bible. Actually, the Bible on what it says actually proves archeology. span They say, well, you know, there was no pilot until they found this, this stone, called we call it the Pilate Stone, that mentions Pilate. And, uh, you know, there was no Pool of Bethesda until they unearthed the Pool of Bethesda. And all of these things, so the Bible is 1,000% true. You can bank on that. So that was a freebie. Captured in 605 B.C. by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It's, it's kind of foretold. Babylon is going to come invade. They're going to exile or pull all of the Israelites out of Israel and take them back into Babylon. Uh, so then as a slave, Daniel lived and he served under three or four different kings, kind of different regimes, different reigns. But <clears throat> this raises a question. How is it that Daniel was exiled as a slave, but then he ended up becoming like a ruler and actually ended up becoming third in charge of all of Babylon? How does something like that or why does something like that, because that doesn't make sense. Slaves don't ascend the ladder. The slaves kind of descend. Now, yes, Nebuchadnezzar was, was smart in this way. He would go into uh, different nations and find kind of the smartest young men, and he would kind of, they would indoctrinate them into their culture and raise them up to be great leaders, and that's what happened. But how is it that Daniel became the third in charge? Anybody want to give it a shot? Other than it was God, of course it was God. But Daniel had a characteristic that I want us to talk about today. In, in uh, Daniel chapter 6, if you want to turn in your Bibles, actually go ahead and turn to Daniel 5, because uh, we're going to start in there. But in Daniel 6 verse 3, it says that Daniel has what's called exceptional qualities. And we're going we're gonna to pick on that in a minute, but... Today, what we're going to do is call those exceptional qualities one specific thing, and that's integrity. Today, I want us to talk about integrity because I think that integrity is so important. Um, the dictionary says integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. That's what the dictionary says. So I've kind of rewritten this uh, definition as to how it pertains to today's message, and I came up with doing the right thing all of the time, no matter what. That's what integrity is. It's when you choose. It's a choice. It never, ever happens by accident. Nobody actually just happened themselves into integrity. It's doing the right thing all of the time, no matter what. No matter what you're presented with, no matter the opportunity, no matter oh, uh, nobody's ever going to know. No, integrity is always making the right choice. And that's a little bit of a challenge, isn't it? I mean, all you got to do is turn on the radio, <clears throat> maybe flip on the TV, 
and you will see a lack of integrity, right? You will hear some things like, um, yeah, that's a, that's a little questionable. That's, uh, I'm not sure they should actually be putting that on the radio, but we see it more and more and more. Um, it was funny. We, we think it's getting so much worse, and it is, and, and things are getting worse. Um, most of you guys know kind of the 90s are my era, okay? Right, Larry? Yep, yep. We joke about this all the time. Okay, I was born in the 70s, but like the 90s are like, so if you give me like one line, I'm not, let's, let's not do this in church right now. That would not be a good time, okay? Because the 90s, Trevor would come out. But if you gave me probably one line from any popular song in the 90s, I would probably be able to quote the rest of the song, at least that verse, okay? So like I was immersed in this. But now I kind of listen back to music. I, a, a song played on the radio a while back, and I was like, oh, yeah, this, you know, this is my jam. And I'm listening to it and go, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't claim that as my jam anymore, right? Because, like, you hear this stuff. Maybe they hit it a little bit more, but just more and more and more now we're hearing stuff that's glorified that's just honestly just gross, disgusting, sinful. And, and it's, it's just what is popular now. Um, there's this, I don't know any other way to say it, but a, a hyper-sexualization in music and our culture. There's an increased acceptance in a moral decline, and that's the world that we're living in. And, and truth, we talk about truth a lot in here, truth um, as defined by God's word or, or even Truth as seen by, just to forget about the Bible just for a second, but just even a moral culture, that truth is even being pushed aside. And we're being encouraged to come up with what? Our own truth. Well, you have your truth and I have my truth and, and we can, you know, see, see differences. And No, no, no. There is one absolute truth and that is what God's word says, Right? So it seems like things are getting worse and worse. So it seems like living with integrity is getting harder and harder, right? Is that, is that true? Is that a fair assessment? Okay, but you would think so. But if we look back at this, this nation, this city of Babylon, it, I, I kind of equate it to, I, I, as a pastor over the last couple of years, and we've talked about this before, I've, I've keep getting this question over and over and over. And as people are observing moral decline in our culture and everything, their question is, do you think that this could be leading up to end times, right? Do you think maybe this is towards the end? And my answer is always the same. If you think that this is the worst that culture has ever been in, like if you think this is the worst morality that culture has ever faced, if you think that this is just the most sinful that it's ever been, then sure, maybe. But as I look through Scripture and, and I learn about history, it's not even close. And that's the picture I want to paint today with Babylon. Babylon was gorgeous. Babylon was known for its riches, its beautiful architecture, its gardens. I mean, this was a classy place as far as aesthetics go. However, Babylon morally was, um, let's just say, sin was normalized and encouraged. And I won't go into details, okay, because we are in church, but it was really, really, really bad. So that's the culture that Daniel was living in. And Daniel was a man who, verse 3 says, he had exceptional qualities. Daniel was a man who decided to choose integrity all of the time, at least he wasn't perfect, but all of the times when we see this in scripture, he was a man of integrity. So in chapter five, I want to kind of set this story up. We have, most of you guys have heard the story of the writing on the wall, and, and I love this. This is all three weeks now, and, and I love seeing this in scripture. When we come across a biblical story, and it's actually borrowed from the secular world, like there's an expression out there with a non-believing world, like, though they can see the writing on the wall, right? That's actually from scripture, and I love that. I love that when the world borrows stuff from the Bible, and they don't, they don't even know it. So King Belshazzar 
who is King Nebuchadnezzar's son of Babylon, okay? Nebuchadnezzar, he went crazy. That didn't end up well. Now we have his son, King Belshazzar, okay? He is serving. He throws this crazy party, and he has this fantastic idea. Let's go down to the treasury. We'll get all of the artifacts and all of the treasures and the things that we stole from the temple in Jerusalem from Yahweh God. Let's get those and let's use all of those cups and everything to party out of. Bad idea, okay? So obviously his pride and his arrogance was through the roof and they're having this party. Things seemingly are going well and then boom, they get this writing on the wall. And he is freaking out. He doesn't know what it means. He calls in all of his wise men and his soothsayers and magicians, and nobody can figure out what it means. And somebody suggests, hey, you should call that guy Daniel. You know that guy Daniel that's on your staff? Like, he can interpret dreams. He can figure out puzzles and things. You need to bring him in. He can tell you what this means. So he brings Daniel in, and we pick up in Daniel chapter 5, verse 16. This is Belshazzar speaking. It says, Now I have heard that you were able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, watch this, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now that's a big deal because Babylon was huge. Babylon was the... uh, preeminent, just the massive empire. They were the rulers of the world at the time. And Daniel, this slave, was a, had the opportunity to become the third highest in power. He's like, listen, I don't know what this means. There's words on the wall and it says, many, many tekel farsin. Okay, he's like, I don't know what that means. And it disturbed him so much, he was basically promising away a lot of his kingdom. Verse 17, then Daniel answered the king, yeah, man, I'll take you up on that. That's a good deal. No, he said, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. This leads us to our first point. Simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over advancement. God gave him a gift. That gift, Daniel thought, you know what? That gift was not given to me that, so that it would advance me. I see an opportunity here where I can be advanced, and I'm not going to take that opportunity for advancement. I'm going to do what God has called me to do because that is God's will. That's why he gave me that gift, and that's it. Whatever happens, happens. That's integrity. Simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over advancement. How often, church, are we faced with an opportunity to just maybe fudge the truth a little bit in order to benefit ourselves? Does that happen pretty often? We get those opportunities. I'm not saying you take it. I mean, we're all church people, so we don't ever do anything wrong, okay? But like we, those opportunities show up sometimes, right? And sometimes we take the easy way out. But those opportunities are just constant. It it, it seems like it's just every day there's an opportunity to take the easy road and not the road of integrity. It's not always easy to make that right choice. So I wrote this down. Honoring God is always more important than pleasing man, and that includes yourself. Honoring God is is always more important than anything else, and that's how we have to see it. It's not about what choice you make. It's not even necessarily about doing the right thing, although you will be doing the right thing. It is about making, God, what choice do I have that is going to honor you? And there's sometimes where it's not exactly black and white. It's not always an easy choice. God, I, I, I don't really know what the right thing to do here is. Is it A or is it B? I don't know. But God, I just want to honor you in my choice. And you know what? Kind of off subject here a little bit, but when we approach things like that, even if there's no right or wrong, when you make a choice that all you're trying to do is 100% honor God, God will honor you in that. 
God will see that as, hey, that's what they're trying to do. They are trying to honor me, and that honors God. Simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over advancement. So, King says, hey, please, please tell me what this means. I'm dying to know. Daniel is brutally honest with him. I mean, Daniel goes just complete savage mode on being honest and telling him, you're prideful, like you're in trouble. God is going to take you down. Like, like in fact, mini mini tekel farsen means your days are numbered and basically you're done. You're like, like, you're, you're toast. Your pride has gotten you here. And Daniel just flat out just tells him, you don't do that, okay? That's a bad choice. You don't go tell this arrogant king who is in the middle of partying, catch my drift, and tell him that, hey, uh, you done messed up, dude. You're going down. That's exactly what he did. But Daniel wasn't about himself. Daniel was just about telling him the truth, telling him what would honor God, and being straightforward. Watch what happens. I'd like to know what happens too. Verse 29. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. What? Wait a minute. Daniel was straight up with him, and he still got rewarded? Yeah, guess what? Sometimes God does that. Now, God doesn't do that every time. It doesn't all just work out great right off the bat. But this time it did. God honored his courage. Then verse 30. That very night... Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. All right, now, move to Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It goes right on here. It says, It pleased Darius, that's the new king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So there's 120 satraps or or like governors basically over all of the different provinces and then three guys are put to be in charge of all of them and Daniel is one of them. Now here's our verse three. Now Daniel uh, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. Now, pause for a second. In other translations, it says an excellent spirit was in him. I wish I had time to kind of explain this and the original words and everything. It's really cool. You can do your own research there. But it says that that by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Daniel stood out so much that this new king, Darius, he was like, there is something special about this guy. Verse 4, At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Wow. Church, may the only offense that the world ever sees against us is that we just love Jesus too much. That, that, that I would love to be known for that. That like, like, I don't see him doing anything wrong in the eyes of that we could hold against him, except he just loves Jesus too much. That's a pretty decent goal. Verse six. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever, which was a common greeting when you first met the king, and we're going to see it again here in a minute. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have, what's that next word? Have all, remember that, have all agreed that the king should issue an edict 
and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, was that word all accurate. Everybody agrees with this, King Darius, that you should make this law that says nobody can pray to anybody else. And remember, this was a very polytheistic uh, culture, so they weren't necessarily anti-Yahweh God. They were just, he was just one of the gods, and they would just pray to them all. They, they may have had their favorites or whatnot, but they're like, listen, listen, everybody agrees. We should just be able to pray to you. Like, like, cause, cause you, King Darius, you're the man. What were they doing? Oh, they were puffing him up a little bit, weren't they? But they lied, didn't they? Do you think Daniel would have agreed to this? Do you think Daniel was there at that time? Definitely not. So they started this on a premise of a lie. It's pretty messed up, right? What a messed up government. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? Listen, I'm so glad our government's got it all together. That reminds me of a true story. Y'all want to hear about it? All right, so there was these three guys, and they were arguing about what's the oldest profession. And the, the one of them says, well, honestly, there, there was a surgeon, and he's like, listen, I think my profession is the oldest because it says Eve was formed from God carving a rib out of Adam, and he formed Eve. So, obviously, surgery, right? That, that's my profession. That's the oldest profession. And there was an engineer there, and the engineer says, well, actually, it says that, you know, God, you know, made everything, and he created everything out of chaos, and, and that's actually what engineers do, right? Engineers, they, they, they bring all of these different parts, and they form them together, right? And there was a politician there. And he said, well, where do you think the chaos came from? <laughs> but I digress. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. I want you to look at the beginning of that verse. It's pretty interesting that when Daniel learned about the decree, he went and broke it. Not because he's a rule breaker, but because he's a rule follower. And he was following this rule that he knew he was supposed to do, pray to his God and he did that three times a day. Daniel didn't stop or start doing something. He just did what he had done before, as the verse says. There is, uh, church, there's an entire sermon in this verse right here. But I need us to know, Daniel was a man of integrity. And, and yes, do we have to obey, obey the laws of the government? Yes, until it supersedes the law of God. Because Daniel was not about to pray to any man or to any other God. Daniel was going to pray to the God because that's what he had always done. Number two, simple followers of Jesus continue in integrity no matter the cost. They continue. They're, they're like, you know what? I've, I've always made the right choice in this and there's a, an, an opportunity that's presenting itself uh, there's maybe uh, something that could be dangerous or harmful that, that's come up. I don't care. I am going to continue to live in integrity because that is what honors God. That's what he has called me to do. Simple followers of Jesus continue in integrity no matter the cost. Verse 11. Then these men went as a group, that's interesting, and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. 
Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. So what did they do? They went and tattletailed on him. They set him up. They, they knew this is what he does. He's going to continue praying. We know how to trap him. They went and made sure with King Darius. Hey, King Darius, isn't this a rule? Yep, that's the rule. Okay, well, your boy Daniel, he broke it. You got to throw him in the lion's den because the law of the Medes and the Persians, it, it says it cannot be repealed. This was a law that could not be overturned even by the king himself. Verse 14, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He knew they had trapped him. He knew he had messed up. He knew he got himself in a situation he did not want to be in. And again, other translations say, when the king heard this, he was greatly displeased with himself. He knew, he's like, I messed up. He probably thought, man, they came in, they sweet-talked me, they, 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 they got my ego inflated a little bit, my pride got in the way, and I messed up. And it's going to cost one of my favorite guys his life. Number three. Simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over concealing mistakes. King Darius had a really big choice to make at this point. Because he could have said, yep, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He should have been praying to me. But he didn't do that. Now listen. I hate making mistakes. Anybody else with me? Man, you just, you hate making mistakes. Like, I, I make my fair share of them, okay? But you know what I hate even worse? Admitting that I made a mistake. Isn't that so much worse? Like, okay, fine, we all make mistakes and we're human and all that stuff. But man, when you have to admit that you made a mistake, what does that do to your ego? Right? I mean, it's, it, it hurts, but simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over concealing their mistakes, over saying, you know what, <sighs> I messed up. I, 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 I need to fix this. And that's what King Darius did. Verse 14, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Now that's kind of interesting right there. It's not a huge theological point, but the reason why he worked so hard until sundown, because normally when you were convicted of something back then, your sentence was carried out at sunset, at sundown. At the end of the day, boom, he was going into the lion's den. And the king knew that. So the king did everything he possibly could. He went and consulted, I'm sure, all the lawyers and, and all of the wise men, all the, the, but you could not overturn the law of the Medes and the Persians. So he worked as hard as he could until the end of the day. Verse 15. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's dead. The king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. Wow. Here's this pagan king. Recognize the steadfastness of Daniel's faith and the strength of his God. This, this pagan king was like, Daniel, there is something about you that I really like. There is something that, that just your God, it's working, man. So, so, May your God, whom you continually serve, who you broke the law, knowing that you were going to be thrown into the lion's den, may that God save you. That king recognized 
that much integrity and just Daniel's God and Daniel's steadfast faith. So here's a question, church. Can your unbelieving friends and family say the same about you? I'll just let that one sit for a minute. When your unbelieving friends and family take a look at you and watch you work and interact in life, can they say that that is a person of the utmost integrity? That is a person that always makes the choice to honor their God. I don't know about that whole Jesus thing. It's kind of weird. Like they gave up every Sunday to go to church. That's weird. They like pray. I don't know about all that. But like there is something about them and, and it's working. Like, like I, I don't get it. Like, they have this peace. Like, like, they went through that thing last year, but, like, they still had joy and peace in the middle of that. I don't get that, but, and then guess what happens? They start to say, I don't, I don't get it, but I want it. I, I, like, I, it seems to be working for them. Maybe that will work for me. So can your unbelieving friends and family say the same about you? And you may say, yeah, but see, I can't do that because I don't, I don't, I don't want to offend people. I don't, I, don't, I don't really share my faith in my, in my workplace or that because I don't want to offend people. And we say this all the time, okay, so you're going to not offend them right into hell. That's better? That's a better option? It's not. Remember, Daniel was now the third highest or, or up there at the top highest official in a very pagan land. Many, many, many times worse than what we are experiencing. And he was able to live with integrity in such a way that it even changed the heart of the king. Verse 17. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve, what's that word? Continually. That's twice that he has said that whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions. Daniel answered, may the king live forever, which there was that greeting that you greeted the king with. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done, ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. He's like, listen, my God, he came through, he shut the mouths of the lions. Oh, by the way, I, I, I want to remind you, I haven't done anything wrong in God's sight and I've not done anything wrong against you. I love that Daniel just threw that in there because I would have done that too, right? <laughs> the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. What an awesome line right there. Let's finish it out. 24. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. A little bit graphic, a little bit shocking, a little bit reality, yes. Here's what I want us to get from this. Daniel being spared was 1,000% God's protection. Because I have heard people say, well, you know, okay, fine, if that story was true, Daniel survived because the lions just weren't hungry, right? And they just did, um, what does it say? Before they even hit the ground, the lions tore them to pieces and crushed their bones, it wasn't because the lions weren't hungry. It was because God is a rescuer. Verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, this is what happens 
When your integrity shines so brightly to someone, to the unbelieving world, and they finally get it. Watch how he reacts here. What, look, look, look what he puts out here. It says, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Wow. That's a pretty cool decree. Like, like listen, forget all those other gods that, that you're worshiping because they ain't it. Okay, Daniel's God, that's the guy I'm going to be following, and I'm saying it's now a law that you have to follow Daniel's God. Now, watch what he writes. Here, this previously pagan king writes almost a psalm about God. He says, For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Wow. Daniel lived in such a way that, man, it changed King Darius. Now, I don't know what King Darius did after that. But I know that Daniel lived with such integrity that people watched him, they observed him, and it changed people. It honored God. That's how we are called to live. Like, I, I, I'm a simple guy. I don't, I don't get everything that's in Scripture. I don't understand it all the time. But I want to know, hey, how am I supposed to live? How am I to model my life after an amazing man like Daniel and ultimately a super amazing man like Jesus? Three qualities of simple followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over advancement. Whenever even you have an opportunity and nobody's ever going to know, choose integrity. Number two, simple followers of Jesus continue in integrity no matter the cost. No matter what, no matter how bad it could be, no matter how good it could be, doesn't matter. Choose integrity. And number three, simple followers of Jesus choose integrity over concealing mistakes. When we do mess up, because guess what? I, I hate to break it to you. I'm so sorry to be the person to tell this. You're going to mess up. And you're going to mess up royally at times. But what is the thing? What is the thing of integrity that we do? We just say, hey, you know what? I, I made a mistake. We own it. Say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, whoever I wronged. I want to make this better. I want to work un, 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 until the sun goes down and tomorrow and the following day and the following day until I can make this as right as I can possibly make it. Simple followers of God choose integrity every single time. Let's pray. God, thank you that we have examples in Scripture like Daniel, like this, this man who was well along, even into his 80s at this time, who chose no matter what to honor you, to, who chose to do what he had always done, to pray to you and to serve you and to make choices that honored you, even in a pagan sinful world God help us to have that kind of courage no matter what God help us to choose integrity help us to live lives in a way that this world around us looks at us and says they're just different and I, I can't put my finger on it maybe it's that whole Jesus thing but God, help us to live in such a way. God, help us to honor you with everything that we do, everything that we say, and everything that we think. God, help us to honor you and have integrity in every single area of our lives. God, in our, in our workplaces. God, in our homes with our families. God, when we go to the store, when we go out to a restaurant. God, may we live in such a way that every single thing that we do reflects goodness, reflects kindness, reflects character. 
and reflects Jesus. God, I know that there would be some this morning here that that don't have a relationship with you, that, that don't really understand why it's so important to live in this way. God, right now in this moment, would you just speak to their hearts? God, help them to see that they need a relationship with a holy God. That there is a judgment coming. God, right now in this moment, convict hearts. God, if they're from far from you, God, right now in this moment, would they turn towards you? God, would they run to you? God, show people their need for a savior. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you are in need of a savior, that you've tried to do this thing on your own, you've relied on your good works or your church attendance or anything else, if that's you right now this morning, would you just turn towards God? Would you realize that Jesus paid it all, that he is the only way into eternity, into heaven with God? So right now in this moment, would you say, hey God, I want to give you my life. I know that I've messed up. I know that I've sinned against you. And that sin deserves to be in hell. So God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Be my savior, Jesus. I trust only in you. God, thank you so much that you are so real. Thank you that you give us a good reason to live. Thank you, God, that we can live, that you call us to live in ways that honor you and follow you and serve you, and God, that you have given us such purpose in life. God, would you be honored by this time of offering? God, would you take it, multiply it, use it in such a way that it furthers your kingdom in this community and in the world. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. And it is in your awesome, holy, holy, holy name that we pray. Amen.